I'm Jennifer Chen, or informally Jenny. Um, so I'm an archaeologist and I'm a second year PhD student at Penn State. And today's talk is going to be about a paper that I co-authored recently that got a lot of media coverage. So some of you guys might have seen this image in particular here um, of a female hunter uh, hunting a vicuña right here. So the paper is titled uh, Female Hunters in the Early Americas. And uh, we challenge a really popular anthropological idea called Man the Hunter with our own results, which I'll be presenting today, that females hunted too. So this is just a brief outline of what I'll be talking about, starting off with familiarizing yourselves with a framework or a popular anthropological idea first before diving right into the archaeological process. I'll also be giving some more background about myself and how I got into the field, um, specifically the Peruvian field, as well as what uh, we found out in Peru and what our conclusions were in the significance of this research as well. I also have some polls and some activities um, could be just because I wanted to make this talk a little bit more collaborative and interactive for you guys. So I really hope that you guys will also be participating in that as well. So first, I want to present to you all an idea that some of you may already be pretty familiar with, um, might not exactly know what it's called, but it's a very patriarchal norm, which is called man the hunter theory that states men hunted while women gathered and foraged or performed domestic work. However, this theory is observed in contemporary or modern groups of hunter gathers only. And in this case, we're looking added archeologically in the past. So then can this idea really be applicable to past hunter gatherers or ancient people? Well, some archeologists seem to think so, but as the title of this presentation suggests, or if some of you guys have already read the paper or articles about the paper, we challenge this theory that only men hunted. Um, so what is, what is it exactly that archaeologists do, right? A lot of you guys are probably thinking Indiana Jones as your first, uh, as like your first image of archaeologists. Um, and I'd like to hear from some of you guys of what you think of what archaeology is. Learning about the past, yeah. That's definitely an aspect of archaeology. I'm glad so far that people have not said dinosaurs. <laughs> That's also another really common answer um, aside from Indiana Jones. All right. Yeah, digging a lot, a lot of digging. There, there's a, quite a bit of digging going on for archeology. span um, However, there's more to it than just digging, right? So before I dive right into the research again, I just wanna kind of quickly explain the entire process of archeology span and just kind of how this paper came into fruition. So archeology span consists of a lot of reading um, and along with the tons of reading and background reading and all the history that goes into a specific region. There's a lot of filling out paperwork to get permission and permits to dig. Then once we get the permits, what we do is that we perform um, a pedestrian survey or uh, where we locate and establish boundaries for an archeological site before the excavation actually begins. So after, ex after excavation, we head back into the lab to conduct whatever lab work is then needed to answer our question. And oftentimes it's kind of goes back to a lot more reading and a lot more paperwork again um, as we develop our analysis of the findings. And then of course, once we actually have results, we then write about our findings and um, that leads to our most recent publication. So I'm gonna be going over each step again in more detail as it relates to the paper um, and our findings for this specific site. But one major thing that I want taken away is that archeology, span as many of you guys know, is not anything like Indiana Jones. It's a lot less whips and dungeons and traps, but it's just a lot of dirt and a lot of digging. I also want to mention that Indiana Jones also has this very machismo narrative that I kind of want to try to break down in today's presentation as well. So I'm clearly not uh, a white male. I am an Asian uh, female and um, I'm probably not someone that you would picture as an archaeologist, but I'm definitely an archaeologist and have been for quite a couple of years already. So before I even got to go into the field to help excavate, I just want to give some background about myself and how I ended up in the archaeological field in Peru. So I studied as an undergraduate at UC Davis in English and biological anthropology. Uh, those two majors had nothing at all to relate to each other. I just picked English. I took a couple of anthropology courses, got really, really into it, and decided to tack that on as a second major as soon as, soon as I realized that I was able to. So I worked um, 
with Dr. Yelmer Erkins down here and Dr. Randy Haas, who are both um, authors in the paper, where I initially did lab work with stable isotope analysis, which I'll explain later on in the presentation as well, on a different archaeological site called Saromakaya Pata, which is just a few kilometers away from the site that we'll be looking at today. And hopefully, if um, my the archaeological process of writing works out for me, hopefully I'll have a, another paper published about Saromakaya Pata soon. So after um, completing my undergraduate's uh, honors thesis in anthropology, I was heavily, heavily encouraged to apply to Penn State's anthropology program because it's known as being one of the best in the nation. But uh, I got rejected. <laughs> and the biggest question that I got um, during this initial interview was that I had never been out into the field in the Andes before. So how would I even know if I liked the field work in the Andes if I've never gone? And this is a completely valid question that I got during the interview that I even asked my undergraduate advisor at the time, Randy Huss, and his response was immediately, all right, pack your trowels, pack your shovel, let's go. So before I could even go out into the Peruvian archaeological field, I had to do a lot of reading about Andean archaeology and other sites so I know what I would be looking at uh, when I actually got into the field. I read a lot of papers and articles from groundbreaking Andean archaeologists like Dr. Jose Capriles, who is now my current graduate advisor. Plot twist, I got into Penn State the second time around. Um, Dr. Christine Hastorf from UC Berkeley, Dr. Maria Bruno from Dickinson College, Dr. Brianna Langley from Binghamton University, who both look at plants and plant domestication um, in the Andes, and Dr. Tiffany Tung from Vanderbilt University, who looks at skeletal trauma and warfare in the Andes, and a bunch more Andeanist scholars that I failed to mention in this small list. But, but as you can see from this list alone, we can see that there are a lot of really influential and powerful female Andeanists. So then begins the 2018 summer field excavations at an archaeological site in the southeastern Peruvian Andes near Lake Titicaca with Dr. Haas's team Proyecto Archaica Cuenca del Titicaca, which roughly translates to Project Archaic Titicaca Basin, where we worked really, really closely with local Aymara families in the area and the Peruvian Ministry of Culture. Um, and typically after, after the end of a field season, what we do is that we take... Um, agents from the Ministry of Culture in Peru and show them exactly what we've done per agreement of the permit that like, yes, we dug here, we dug this deep um, before we backfilled in all the holes and stuff. So previous archaeological work at the site included a pedestrian survey where each member of the team walked around in the area in lines like this here, and they have um, these small little flags where they flag and they stick into the ground um, next to any surface artifacts that they find, like stone tools. And once we see where the clusters of artifacts were, we establish the site boundaries seen in panel A right here. So the dashed line is the site boundary of where we found clusters of artifacts all within this area here. And in panel B, which we'll be looking at much more closely today, um, are the six different burials that we've found. So this is burial one, two, three, four, five, and six. So before I start tossing around numbers and dates around, uh, for some context, I made a timeline that's hopefully going to be helpful in kind of aligning yourself geographically um, on a geologic time scale and also in a cultural sense as well. So at the very end here, you have the late Pleistocene and the early Holocene, uh, where megafauna like giant ground slots would still be roaming around South America. Later on, we have Willamayapata, the site that we recently established to be around 9,000 years old that we'll be looking at today. And then we have Tiwanaku, which some of you may already know or have heard of as the first established state civilization in the Andes. And then after the collapse of Tiwanaku comes the late intermediate period here where civilization collapses and there's a lot of warfare between smaller groups of people. And then finally, uh, we have we approach the popularly known Inca Empire and the famous archaeological site of Machu Picchu, 
Um, in a more modern sense or in a more contemporary sense, uh, you could think of The Emperor's New Groove as one of the famous Disney movies. Um, so that's around the time of the Inca Empire. And then the Spanish conquest happens in 1533, causing the Inca Empire to unfortunately fall. And after colonization, it leads to the present day where we have contemporary indigenous groups like the Quechua and the Aymara in the Andes. So this timeline is just a really, really brief summary that shows that a lot can happen over the past 12,000 years, right? So now that we have a rough timeline of things, we have our site, Willamaypata, all the way back here at 9,000 years ago. So even before the first state uh, formation uh, that happens in the Andes Tiwanaku, we have Willamaypata at 9,000 years ago. So the site is named Willamaypata, uh, which is Aymara for a place of a place. It's a clever name. <laughs> and is located at 3,925 meters above sea level, which in feet would be roughly around 12,870 feet above sea level. And the radiocarbon dates uh, from this site suggest that this is particularly early that dates back to around 9,000 years ago, so back in the early Holocene. And these are just some nicer pictures that I took uh, while I was out in the Andes in the field and some of the excavation pits that we dug. And usually, um, in the middle of digging, we'll find some alpaca and llama herds that are just kind of randomly walking by grazing. Um, and we were kind of worried that they would fall into the holes, but they were pretty good about um, jumping over them, which was a relief because oftentimes um, excavations happen through uh, a long period of time for several weeks on ends. And we can't just backfill these excavation pits every single time that we dig. So at Willamayapata, we found six individual burials. However, in our paper, we mostly focus on individuals one and individual six. So in this burial pit here, we're only focusing on individual one and individual six right here. WMP, which stands for Willamayapata, uh, one and individual six are our primary focuses because the radiocarbon dates sent them back as some of the earliest burials in South America that date back to the early Holocene and big game hunting tools were also found in situ, or in this case in the ground associated with the same layer as these burials as well. We also found some faunal bone remains of big game that were also associated with these burials, including vicuña here, which are the wild versions of alpacas, and taruca, which is Andean deer. And these are just some examples of um, some zooarchaeological examples of the, um, the vicuña bone and the taruca bone. So we know that they both hunted um, that they were both hunted, but I'm kind of curious what you guys think. So try to think like a bit like an archaeologist now, or try to think a bit more like a, a hunter now, if you will, um, of which do you think they mostly hunted? So again, you're going to be using either the QR code or typing it or typing in your answers here. All right, more Vicuña. Oh, some Taruka. More Vicuña though. All right. So there is technically no wrong answer, right? However, we do know some of the paleoecology of Vicuña and Taruca. So typically with Vicuña, they travel in, in um, much more tight um, herds and their ranges are much more small compared to the Andean deer than compared to Taruca. So we have a suspicion that they mostly hunted Vicuña more than they did Taruca because the home ranges uh, for the Taruca for Andean deer is much bigger. So our first individual is um, individual one with a photo and digitized image of this individual on the right with the associated big game hunting tools like these two volcanic uh, volcanic rock projectile point here and a projectile point made of chalcedony. You can kind of see them in the image here, but in this digitized image, you can kind of see it a bit more clear of where they were and how they were associated with the burial remains. So... Our second individual is uh, WMP6, or in, in this case, I'm just going to refer to this individual as individual two or individual six. Um, and this individual had a ton of tools, 
all of this were associated uh, within this burial and they were stacked one right on top of each other. That included projectile points, retouched flakes, scrapers, choppers, burnishing stones and ochre. Um, and so you can see how they were all kind of associated in this digitized image here uh, with this burial. And so projectile points were typically used as spearheads like these uh, for hunting big game. And the flakes and choppers would have been used uh, for cutting meat from their hunt. Scrapers would have been used to make leather. So they would be scraping off the excess meat from the skin. Um, and then burnishing stones and ochre would have been used to pigment or dye the leathers and furs. So even though we find them associated with hunting tools, we still don't know exactly what they were eating. We can assume that they were eating Taruka and Vicuña, but we don't know for certain, right? So to figure out what these individuals were eating, we took a small portion of their bone and some of their teeth enamel for processing here. I drilled the first layer of dirt off the bone so that it would be clean before putting it in a bath of water that was later sonicated several times for further cleaning. And then the bone and enamel samples underwent a chemical process where the bones soaked in acidic chemicals for several days before being bathed in a basic solution and then put into an oven that further processes the bone to collagen. So you can kind of see here how our samples have kind of disintegrated and liquefied almost. So after the samples have completely turned um, into a liquid solution, we put them in a freeze dryer for about a week until we get a fluffy cotton candy-like um, collagen right here. It's really, really fluffy. It kind of smells like caramel, um, which is a, a little disturbing. <laughs> Uh, from human remains, yeah. So the collagen is then measured out into a small tinfoil capsule so that they can be put into a mass spectrometer where we get our stable carbon and nitrogen values. But before I dive into the results of the stable isotopes, um, I, which can be confusing, I want to explain how stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes work. So first, we'll be talking about stable carbon isotopes. The stable carbon isotopes can tell us which photosynthetic pathways um, or what type of photosynthesis is being used by respective plants. There are usually three types of pathways. There is the uh, there's the C3 pathway, the C4 pathway, and the CAM pathway. The CAM pathway is a little bit more complicated and the isotopes are mixed between C3 and C4. So for today's talk, we're just only going to be looking at C3 and C4 pathways here. This can look really complicated. I personally myself don't have a deep, deep understanding of the photosynthetic pathway, but I'm going to simplify this for you. Further. So the biggest difference between C3 and C4 plants is that the C4 pathway just has this one extra step here. And you can kind of think about it like this. So because of this extra step, the carbon values for C4 plants like corn or sugar cane will have higher values. So the numbers will be much bigger, while C3 plants like potatoes uh, will have lower values. So carbon can explain uh, the different types of plants that people have been eating based on photosynthetic pathways, while stable nitrogen isotopes can tell us what types of animals were being eaten. I really like to use this example of a fish eating a fish eating another fish here, where, uh, the, lo where the bottom fish has the lower values because they're going to be mostly eating plants or smaller organisms. In other words, um, it, while the biggest fish have the, the higher values, right? So in other words, you can kind of say that you are what you eat um, in terms of stable isotopes. So now that we have a basic understanding of both carbon and nitrogen isotopes, let's kind of combine, combine the two together. So down here you have C3 plants like potatoes and tomatoes and C4 plants like sugarcane and corn. And since they're plants, they tend to fall lower on the nitrogen scale here. However, there are some exceptions to plants that have high nitrogen values like aquatic plants like seaweed or algae and drought resistant plants like pine nuts and pine cones. We also have the herbivores here like the, the cow and the chicken that, were, that will most likely be eating corn um, or grasses. And then on the higher end of the nitrogen spectrum, we have mussel and fish that tend to eat a lot more smaller living organisms in the ocean. So you're quite literally what you eat. Annotate where you think you would fall on this carbon and nitrogen biplot here.
Um, yeah, so just for reference, uh, vegetarians would be somewhere further down here, um, although, or somewhere down here, because we do have a lot of corn syrup and corn products in our processed foods. Um, mostly carnivorous people will be somewhere up here, right? So you are quite literally what you eat. So if you eat a lot of fast food, for example, a lot of hamburgers and French fries, you're most likely gonna be falling somewhere in between here. So now that we're kind of experts in reading dietary reconstruction plots, uh, what exactly were they eating, right? We found hunting tools and faunal remains in the excavation pits associated with individual one and six, but we just can't assume without additional evidence and hard science and hard facts that they were eating meat. So this is where my expertise comes in, which is the stable isotope analysis. And in, in the case of the paper, um, it's actually in the supplementary part, portion of the paper. So the stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes from uh, the bone collagen and bone appetite can help reconstruct ancient diet. I've also included images of what the of what some of the resources are like out in the Andes because they're going to be very different than the ones here. So your C3 plants are um, most likely potatoes or tubers. The camelids here, um, the game that they're going to most likely be big, the big game that they're most likely going to be hunting would be vicuña or taruca. Um, and then the C4 plants are most likely corn, or in this case in the Andes, there are some C4 plants like amaranth species, um, like wild quinoa. And then for fish near Lake Titicaca, there's a lot of trout. So for the carbon isotopes um, along the x-axis here, um, the higher the values, meaning the less negative the values are, the more C4 plants that they will be eating. So an example of C4 plants are like corn and in the Andes some amaranth species, like I said. So using so plants using the C3 photosynthetic pathways like potatoes and tubers are going to have much lower values, meaning they're, they're going to be much more negative along the x-axis. And in this graph here, again, the light green are the C3 and then the dark green are the C4 plants. So nitrogen values, however, answer the question of what was being, what is eating what, right? So along the y-axis of the graph here, you can see that the vicuña are a little bit higher up than compared to some of the, um, the, the C3 plants here. And that's mostly because the vicuña will, will, are most likely eating the C3 plants and the C4 plants. So they're kind of in between both right here, right? So long story short, again, you are quite literally what you eat here. And in this, ex and in this graph, we show um, individual six, uh, their collagen diet, which reflects carbon and nitrogen values. So we can kind of see here that this individual is most likely eating um, potatoes, right? Which is a little bit unexpected. You would expect that they would look a lot more like the vicuña here if they were eating um, more big game or vicuña, but we don't see that. Instead, we see this individual here. We did not include individual one in this because um, our samples were, for lack of better words, contaminated. Um, so the, the numbers um, and the isotopic ratios were just unreliable and we didn't wanna present that uh, for our paper. So collagen diet only looks at the last couple of years of this individual's life but if we want to look at the diet overall for the entire life for generally um, a much longer span of an individual's life we will look at the enamel or the appetite diet instead so we can see here individual one is along this line here and then individual six is along this line here and they're both placed really really nicely in between both c3 plants and camelids or vicuña so they're most likely eating both potatoes and vicuña so now that we have a general idea of what they were eating we want to know more about the individuals themselves like were they male or were they female which is kind of the heart of the paper right so archaeologists can reliably sex individuals just by looking at the pelvis as one of the main indicators of, um, of, in, of identifying female or males. The pelvis on the left is much more narrow, while the pelvis on the right is much more wide and shorter. So blank pelvises are female. So are wider and shorter pelvises female or are narrow and taller pelvises male or female? So which one do you think is most likely female? Cool. Yeah, the wider and shorter pelvises are most likely going to be female, right? And that's because 
the birth canal must be big enough in order for um, a child to actually go through. Otherwise, this would be quite painful. So with that knowledge, we can take a closer look at the Willamaya Pata burials. Um, but as you can see, the pelvises are missing. So the archaeological record is rarely ever complete. Um, because a lot of it just deteriorates and degrades over time. So what exactly can we do to sex these individuals if a key skeletal element like the pelvis is missing, right? We did have other pieces. We had femurs instead. Dr. Jim Watson from um, Arizona State had a hunch that uh, individual six was female based on the femurs. So we can see here the femur bone is the biggest bone in our is the biggest long bone in our body here. And we can see at the distal end or at the end portion of this bone that the intercondylar notch, this is much more narrow in males and much more wide in females. So we had a hunch, but we're still, but it's still specul speculative. And we wanted again hard facts and evidence. So we wanted to be absolutely sure that this individual was female because then this would be groundbreaking for the man, the hunter theory, right? So Dr. Glendon Parker, another co-author of this paper, analyzed the dental enamel peptides to look at the protein specific to the sex. So this protein, A-M-E-L-Y, is observable only in male individuals, meaning that the protein is missing in females. After collecting an animal samples from both individuals, we can securely sex um, the first individual as male because it contains this protein while our an, um, while individual number six is actually female because this protein is missing in the biomolecular analysis. So now that we kind of so now that we confirm that individual six is actually female, this again challenges a popular theory in anthropology called man the hunter that we talked early on in this presentation that suggests again, men hunted and women gathered or did domestic work like preparing and cooking food. So in a sense, we have a sexual division of labor among hunter gatherers uh, with this man the hunter theory. But this theory has been really debated, has, has been heavily debated and criticized, especially using modern and contemporary hunter-gatherers now. So for example, doctors Doug and Rebecca Bird at Penn State study the Mardu hunter-gatherers, and they've noted that contemporary Mardu women in Australia's Western desert frequently hunt. The men hunted, the women hunted, and even the children hunted. Everyone hunted. And this definitely challenges the man, the hunter theoretical framework. So at the beginning, we asked if this would apply archeologically. So we decided to further investigate that question of whether or not this theory can apply archeologically to past peoples. Because there's a lot of archaeological literature about past hunter-gatherers, we decided to further narrow down our search just to look at the Americas during the late Pleistocene to early Holocene timeline. So after some more reading and more research into the topic, we found an archaeological site called Upward Sun River in Alaska that uncovered two female infant burials. And similar to the Willamayapata individuals, we're very confident that these two infant burials are female uh, because of biomolecular methods that are similar to the dental enamel protein analysis that we did. What was really interesting about these two female infant burials is that they were buried in situ um, or in the ground with the associated big game hunting tools, exactly like these projectile points and spearheads here. So I know a lot of you are probably thinking, but wait a second, Jenny, infants and babies can't hunt. That's a completely fair assessment, but let me get you thinking just a little bit more. Burial goods or grave goods are often involve, uh, they often involve items or objects that reflect who the individual was or did, right? So a popular archeological example would be Egyptian burials where a lot of gold and riches are often associated with important or royal individuals like this example of King Tut's uh, burial here. Also, children are often influenced by who they are around, and they often learn how to be an adult pretty early on in life. This example here are two girls stereotypically playing house, while these two boys are stereotypically playing construction with trucks. They're learning their prospective future adult roles early on in their childhood. So we could argue with this knowledge that these projectile points and spearhead grave goods that the female infants at Upward Sun River heavily suggests that they were prospective hunters. So the fact that our individual, individual six, was found and associated with a ton of big game hunting tools like this image here heavily suggests that this individual was actually a female hunter. 
So this brings further questions like how far spread were female hunters in the Americas during the late Pleistocene to early Holocene? Were they rare? Were hunter-gatherer groups back then also egalitarian? It's going to be a vital, it's going to be super vital and super important to go back to some of these archaeological sites on this map here and revisit old material with these new methods, especially and especially with the more feminist perspective as well. So statistics also suggest that at least 30 to 50 percent of females participated in big game hunting during this time period, during the late Pleistocene to early Holocene transition, based on other archaeological sites with female burials. So this egalitarian hunting is super is a super plausible model where it was common for women to hunt. And again, we would have to go back at some of these older archaeological sites within the Americas to actually do a full on analysis of um, to make sure that these percentages are accurate. So finally, I just wanna leave you off with a, a fun video from my time out in the field with Tina, the alpaca. Uh, we were staying in this small little adobe um, complex and the family there had an alpaca. And when I asked um, the alpacas for the alpaca's name, they didn't have a name. <laughs> So I decided to name the alpaca Tina. Please don't <laughs> All right. So are there any questions? Are there plans to do any other isotopic analyses on the remains other than what's already been done with the uh, with the current work? Yeah, for sure. So we had, um, so again, we established that there were six burials, but this paper only looks at two of the burials. Um, I did isotopic work for all of the other individuals as well. I think there was only one individual that had, um, that their results were contaminated um, or unreliable. So we have five other ones, I believe. Um, they're currently not published. Um, Hopefully, and this will hopefully spur another paper um, of what these individuals were eating as well. I'm also currently working on, um, for my graduate work, I'm working on stable isotope analyses of camelids um, and looking at early pastoralism in the Andes. Okay, we did have a question here in the chat. How many individuals might be in this community that the hunter would have fed? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Um, hunter gather groups tend to stay relatively small. Um, and typically when they do hunt, um, they don't carry back the entire game. They, they tend to not carry back the entire game with them because it's really big and really heavy. So what they would do is that they would butcher it on site. Um, that's a really good question of like how many people, um, there's definitely some studies out there done on hunter on like ancient hunter-gatherer groups um, and population sizes. Um, but as for this group, we're not entirely sure. That's a really good question. All right. So do we know would it have been men or women or both making these projectile points? It most likely has um, have been both men and women making these projectile points um, because there are some archaeologists out there that would argue that the projectile points can also be used to butcher and, and cut the food. So like preparing the food for cooking instead of actually being used to hunt. Um, so women would also be making projectile points as well. All right. So is there any evidence that all chores were shared, such as cooking? That's a good question. Um, as for as for the sexual division of labor for cooking, um, we're not entirely sure. It again, with it's it's really hard to step out of this patriarchal narrative for man the hunter. Um, but I, I would assume that like men would all would have also participated in cooking. But I would imagine uh, it again. There's not a lot of archaeological evidence. Um, that kind of shows like who did the cooking. We know what was being cooked, but we're not entirely sure who did the cooking. That's a really good question that I'm probably going to think a lot about now for the rest of the day on how you can actually think about it archaeologically. Okay, so is there going to be any further excavation at the same site? Yeah, so we actually, if we honestly continued digging, we probably would have found more burials. Um, but again, archaeology is time and money. 
um, and we had a limited amount of time there. Um, so there will most likely be excavations going on, if not at the same exact site, then at um, sites that have also been really similar. So again, with the archeological process, what we tend to do is that we, we do a pedestrian survey and we kind of walk to find artifact scatters on the surface. And um, if there's a lot of artifact scatters on top of a surface in a specific area, then what we'll do is that we'll, we'll document that site call it an archeological site and then go back to it in the future for excavations. Okay, so the pits did not look that deep. Were the artifacts closer than usual to the surface? Yeah, the pits were actually not that deep. So typically when we dug, um, when we dig um, down in the Andes at least, what we like to do is that we just like to get through the agricultural zone. So if we were to be looking at the, um, the if you were to actually be standing in the pit itself, I think we were probably only not even three meters down. Um, yeah, we weren't that deep. Um, we just kind of dug through the the agricultural zone, um, and then from there we did a more a much more systematic and more careful um, digging from the plow zone. So typically with plow zone and stuff, um, because there's a lot of agriculture in the Andes, um, a lot of uh, what we end up finding is has been mixed up together. So the stratigraphy or the dirt layers are not um, reliable for dates. So we just like to dig right through the plow zone. And then once typically once we dig through the plow zone after a couple of centimeters down, we do tend to find burials. Okay, so we did have a question if uh, technology like ground penetrating radar could be used, but it sounds like with what you've just described, it might preclude that because the soil has been disturbed. Yep. A lot of the soil has been disturbed in the Andes. All right. So have, uh, is there any evidence of looting on the sites? Um, not this specific site, but who's to say that people won't just walk around and they'll find an artifact right on the surface and just pick it up and take it home. I consider that looting. Um, but otherwise in the Andes, there's all throughout the Andes, there's a ton of archeological looting, especially along the coastlines, uh, especially with Nazca and the, the Nazca mummies. All right, so it looks like that's all we've got for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you very much to Ms. Jennifer Chen for helping us discover more about our world. Uh, so in case anyone is still kind of fuzzy on the difference between an archaeologist and a paleontologist, join us next week when we will have a paleontologist. Uh, that's going to be a paleontologist and doctoral student Megan Jacobs. And she will be uh, presenting on a new genus and species of ichthyosaur that she helped identify that was discovered off the coast of the UK, where she's from. Uh, she's currently in the States working on her doctoral, uh, I believe at Baylor, and she will be joining us next Wednesday at noon. Uh, you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. <laughs>